uh, Hines. I must apologize for the absence of the CMO who five minutes ago had to leave for circumstances beyond his control. So, um, Dr. Hines, please, and then Dr. Richard Zee will give us your report. Good afternoon, Honorable Prime Minister, Honorable Ministers, colleagues, members of the media, members of the viewing and listening public. Today I'm going to present the brief, uh, both clinical and epidemiologic updates. As we would have seen, uh, released yesterday at 4 p.m., as at the 14th of May, we had a total of 151,103 tests performed, of which 15,379 would have come back as positive over the entire time frame of testing. Uh, yesterday's update in new cases was 565 new positives. Out of the total active cases, of, we have 365 in hospital, we have 4,198 in home self-isolation, and we have 86 in step-down facilities. There have been 265 deaths to date, and we extend our condolences to the members of those bereaved families. Uh, also on this update, we, are, we stand at 60, over 60,000 uh, vaccinated persons with their first dose and fully vaccinated people standing at 1,179. Looking as we always do at our epidemic curve, we see that we have continued in that upward trend with the tallest bars, the gold bars on the right, representing the daily numbers for the month of May and those being much taller than those for the month of April and for the months prior to that with that rolling average continuing to increase. And looking at these numbers both by a weekly and a monthly basis, we see that that upward trend is, is reflected in each of these time scales. The important aspect of this particular graph beyond the numbers being that we can see where the positivity, meaning the number of positives that we get back for every 100 cases is now around 43%, which indicates that 43 out of every 100 people that get tested because they've come for symptoms or they've come because of exposure come back with a positive COVID result at this point in time. Similar figures, different time scale, showing that the first two weeks of May have actually accumulated over 4,500 cases, and that exceeds the total for the four weeks of April and any of the totals prior. So we're seeing that upward trend continuing. And just for the month of May overall, we see that the uh, the percentage positivity is around 40%. This is an indication of the distribution of those who have gotten ill for the entire community spread time frame. Looking at the male to female ratio, 52% male, 55% in that 25 to 49 age group. We're going to compare the total with just the 1st of April to 14th of May. Same basic shape, same basic age groups being affected. And if you just look at the first two weeks of May, again, same basic shape, same basic age groups affected. A little more of a swing towards women, so it's about 49% women, and a little bit of an increase in that male 55 to 59 age group, but same people being infected, essentially. You look at the deaths, and we see that there has been a swing towards a greater proportion of female deaths, uh, so that whereas they were around 25, 24% before, they are now at 34.7% of the total deaths, and we have seen that the older age group, which was the vast majority, nearly 70%, is now a little less, is now 64%, and there's nearly 36% of those in the under 60 age group contributing to that overall total of deaths. This is the geographic distribution which stands, as we've seen it before, population centers, more numbers. And looking at how we've projected and how those projections have performed, what we did note is that we saw that sharp upward uh, trend over to the right-hand side of this graph where the bars get progressively taller very quickly and that we were on track to double between the 5th of April and the 14th of May, uh, whereas we didn't quite reach that landmark, we weren't very far off. So we can't say that there's been a major, a major change in the trend. So too, looking at this graph where the green line shows where we expected the cases to go projecting forward, and we see that the bars have basically performed as projected, largely reaching the totals on a day-to-day -day basis. Looking at the new and active cases, current and projected, starting in May, 
the second where we gave this as a projection, we've seen that largely as we go from update to update, we have more or less continued along that same upward trend, that same rapid increase uh, that we have been warning about and that we're concerned about with respect to its effects on the parallel healthcare system and the health system as a whole. So I'm going to end here and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Richards who will give us the update on that parallel healthcare system. Good afternoon, Honorable Prime Minister, Honorable Ministers, uh, my colleagues, Dr. Hines and Dr. Trotman, ladies and gentlemen of the media, members of the viewing and listening public of Trinidad and Tobago. Good afternoon and thank you for your continued attendance at these media conferences as we provide up-to-date information on the activities regarding the parallel healthcare system and COVID-19. This afternoon, I come to you with some clinical statistics for the parallel healthcare system with specific emphasis on the state of the hospitals. That is how occupied and filled our hospitals in the parallel healthcare system are. As my colleague, Dr. Hines, would have indicated, the rolling average in terms of the number of cases per day continues to increase and is currently at 380 cases per day over the last seven days. And that really represents an increasing number of hospitalizations at our seven hospitals in the parallel healthcare system, all of which as of today are occupied. This graph demonstrates the increasing number of cases and the number of admissions and the number of discharges. And you would notice that the number of admissions continues to exceed the number of discharges. That is the hospital has a net increase on a daily average in terms of the number of patients. If I was to expand this graph, so you would see there's been an increasing upward trend in admissions, and it is a dynamic situation that changes day by day, but you would notice that there's been an increase in terms of that gap that we are seeing between admissions and discharges. Now, as far as that widening of the gap is concerned, this really represents an increase of between 30 and 50 patients on a daily level across each hospital and um, across the hospital system. And this gap really represents where we as people can look in terms of the COVID-19 mitigation measures. Now, the Ministry of Health, in its response, increased the number of beds in the parallel healthcare system by 130 between Monday and Wednesday of this week. And what I'd like to remind everyone is as fast as we increased these beds, they were filled. Hospital admissions, yet again, variable but generally increasing. And if we look at the overall occupancy, the red line represents Trinidad and Tobago, the blue total occupancy, and the yellow Tobago occupancy. Overall occupancy for Trinidad and Tobago today is at 64%, but if we split Trinidad from Tobago, we are looking at a 73% um, hospital occupancy. Please do not be comforted by the fact that we have 27% more occupancy level. As I've been indicating, and as you all know, a bed is no longer a bed. And even though there may be physical beds, the resources that are required to give you the best level of care may not and are not available. Um, in terms of ward level occupancies, um, you would see, sorry, Tobago is roughly on average around 25%, but Trinidad continues to increase. Even more worrisome are the ward occupancy levels across Trinidad and Tobago with particular emphasis to Trinidad and Tobago. And today I would like to let everyone know that in our previous conversations we have been speaking about a 10 day, a 7 day and a 5 days to go before the beds are all occupied. It's no longer 5 days, it has been touch and go for the last 3 to 4 days and all our beds are occupied. At the HDU level, 95% of all beds in Trinidad and Tobago are occupied. At the ICU level, all beds are filled. And we are in the situation of having to add beds, convert beds, add ventilators on a daily basis. The ward level beds are currently at 66% and our new step down facilities are at 57% today. Just a breakdown of the hospitals and the individual hospital occupancy levels that we have Tobago is at 25%, and if we look at that red line, which is that danger line in terms of where our resources are, nurses, ventilators, doctors, laboratory testing capacity, we will see that the Cora Hospital 
has exceeded that line. This morning, the Cora Hospital was at 78%. The Coover Medical and Multi-Training Facility, where we have our most ill patients, is at 71%. And, um, you know, at considerate strain, the Arima Hospital, where we expanded by 20 beds um, over the last weekend, is already at 85%. The Augustus Long Hospital, where we expanded by 10 beds, is at 90%. And now the St. Anne's Hospital, which was previously empty overnight, is at 80%. And this is just a reminder of the resources that we've been charting. And you can see that the ambulance system is now at 50%, increasing considerably over the last couple of weeks in terms of COVID-19 transports. In closing today, I'd like to just remind everyone that the increasing hospitalization levels, increasing number of beds, really um, is a co cause of concern for all of us because at this rate, we are basically out of hospital beds. And it means that if you require care, then you will not be receiving the best level of care. Today, on behalf of my colleagues and the Ministry of Health and every frontliner, I would like to appeal to everyone to please continue to practice the COVID-19 measures. Every time you take a chance to go on a line, every time you take a chance and think it's not me who is going to get COVID, you are taking a significant risk. If death has not arrived at your doorstep, please know that it's probably in your workplace or in your neighborhood. Please, Trinidad and Tobago, Let's work together. We are a generally a resilient and a civic-minded population. Let's continue to practice the COVID-19 measures. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Richards. I'll ask Dr. Trotman a little later on to give us some assistance before we close the press conference. Dr. Trotman will come on a little later on to tell us a bit about home management of people who are in quarantine at home or who should be in quarantine at home. So Dr. Chapman will come and talk to us about that um, quarantining at home. Um, and of course you see the relevance of that against the background of what Dr. Richards and Dr. Hines would have told us. But ladies and gentlemen, um, we in Trinidad and Tobago pride ourselves in having a short memory. But I want to ask you to cast your mind back to the early days of this contact with you and the population and me as Prime Minister talking to you. I said at the beginning and I'm saying now that my measurement of this crisis or this challenge would always be whether or not we are able to provide health care to those who need it. And we gave the commitment that we'll do everything that has to be done so that we would be in a position to provide that health care to those unfortunate persons whose circumstances require being put in an institution. <clears throat> in the protocols that we had early on, and which still remain in force, it was sound very simple. If you are sick, don't come out to work. Stay home. That sick might be COVID, so stay home. Meaning that you don't come out and spread it around. You keep it as close as possible to yourself, even away from your family. So we do know that there are a lot of people who are following that restriction, not feeling well, staying home, Probably COVID positive, more likely, but they stay home. But we also know that a lot of people who would have been exposed as primary contacts and some of those primary contacts who may develop as positive COVID uh, instances would have been circulating. So the numbers that you've been getting from the government from day one had always to be taken as a part of the story because these are confirmed cases that have come to the attention of the health authorities. And we always knew that there were other people who either didn't feel well today and stayed home, or we also had the asymptomatic persons who didn't see any sign of sickness, but in fact, upon testing, found that they were 
So now the situation. So now that we are being told that our hospitals are as they have been described by Dr. Richards, the question arises, is the state still in a position to say that we will provide health care to those who want it? What cannot be said is that we did not put arrangements in place for a reasonable response, starting with, fortunately, being able to put in place what we call a parallel health care system. Luckily for this country, when we were called upon to bring the hospitalization into play, we had four, not one, not two, not three, but four hospitals, new hospitals, that could have been the backbone of this. We had the Coover Hospital, which had just been opened partially. We had the Point Fourteen Hospital, which had just been completed. We had the Arima Hospital, that had just been completed. And lastly, we had the Roxborough Hospital, that has just been completed. And of course, in occupying the Point Fourteen Hospital, we have released the old Point Fourteen Hospital as an item of use. Then, of course, with the uh, restructuring of Petrotrin, we had the Augustus Lung Hospital. So we were fortunate that we have had these additions. I want you to ask yourself, if these were not available and the normal public health system was what we were dealing with, San Fernando, Port of Spain, and Eric Williams, if that is what we were dealing with, what would have been our situation? So as bad as it looks now, it would have been a hundred times worse if the normal health system without those additions were not available to allow us to have the parallel system. And of course, from a human response arrangement, last year, April, March into April, when the fear of this virus was very much in front of all of us, not knowing what the virus could or could not do, except we understand that it was going to be bad. Because that time we were looking at Italy and Europe, where it was very bad. The population in Trinidad and Tobago responded admirably to the entreaties of the government. Remember? We had our lockdown, we stayed home, children were home from school, everybody was home, and it went like normal. And soon after, as the numbers remain relatively stable and manageable, we started to roll it back out and we came back out. One year later, it's a different story. We now have vaccines to look forward to and vaccines to be had. We know people who got sick and got over. And of course, there's only five people dead, one dead, sometimes some days nobody dead. So we can do what we want. And I must tell you, as someone who has been monitoring this, the behavior was that we were more confident in treating with the virus. And now that we are at a situation where the reports are that we are, even with the parallel health system, we are running out of bed space for those persons who require it. Because it's not everybody who is positive with COVID or even everybody who is symptomatic requires hospitalization. Those who get warded, especially as they move up in the system to HDU and ICU, those are a portion of the people who are sick. And therefore it requires a far firmer response at the individual level to make sure that as we are running out of space, as more people are getting sick and a fraction of those people are requiring beds and beds are becoming unavailable, we now have to be even more cooperative than we were last year, April. Unfortunately, that is not what we've been having. But I'm not here blaming anybody. I'm just pointing out to you the facts of the situation. So today in Trinidad and Tobago, we have a population that 
is now scared. I woke up yesterday morning and people were literally telling me to press the panic button. Today, you see what advice we're getting from people who only recently were telling us that we were being unnecessarily disruptive. And of course, there were some who never took it seriously and thought that we were just generally annoying people. I'm sorry that it has come to coffins and the faces of dead people for us to realize that we are in and always has been in a very difficult place. Before, we were dealing only with numbers, but I think the population is at the stage now where the numbers are being seen to be numbers of people even known to you. Because some of the people, unfortunately, who have demised recently have been known to all of us, either in the work that they did or the places they've been or just who they are. So we're no longer dealing with numbers. We are now dealing with 21 deaths in one day. And if you bring that down to per hour, it's almost one person dying every hour. That is a frightening situation. And of course, if that is allowed to multiply, if that is allowed to multiply, very soon we would be happy when it's only 21. Because it could go to a number where 21 it's a great improvement. That's how it goes. Because the more we are allowing ourselves to be infected, that population of infected people would generate a larger population of sick people and will generate a larger population of dead people. So ladies and gentlemen, today we will do what we have to do to further minimize the opportunities for infection and we are expecting that with a population that is now even more responsive that this is the time for us to take it serious, take it personal, take it home. I have had these discussions with the Attorney General with the Ministry of Health. Unfortunately, CMO is not here with us at this moment. But we are going to make additional attempts to reduce the spread or the opportunity for spread of the virus. So from midnight tonight, Trinidad and Tobago will be under a state of emergency involving a curfew that from then onwards would be 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. Meaning that if you don't have to be out for exempted reasons, you stay home under force of law. However, it is not feasible to shut down a country much as we would like everybody to be home. Even to be home, you need some people to be out. We were carrying a balancing act, lives and livelihood all the time, managing some livelihood activities with some save your life activities. The situation now with the threatened inability to provide health care means that the input on the life side on that seesaw, we've got to put more effort on the life side now than on the livelihood side for a little while. So the essential service would remain essential. And by later in the day, the Attorney General's office would put out the specific details, as much details as we could. But suffice it to say that there are areas that will not be affected in terms of closure because they are the areas that are required to keep us alive and we can't close those areas but the other areas 
we are shut down virtually completely. National security in all its forms, of course the health department in all its forms, the Ministry of Energy's work, the energy sector remain under. The utilities will remain exempted. Ports and airports will remain exempted. All tentacles of the food supply chain, from food packaging, food preparation, food distribution, supermarkets, groceries will remain because we have to be fed. Pharmacies, public transport, and elements of private transport, and the details of that will come out. And of course, these are essentials to keep us where we are at home. And there may be one or two more that will have to be added as we go forward. And if then you are not in those categories, like for example in the public service, we will determine which specific aspects of the public service will come out to support these entities. I mean, everybody expects to get paid at the end of the month while they're staying home. But to get paid at the end of the month staying home means that some people have to come out to work. We are providing support to people from the Social Services Ministry. Those workers have to come out to do the work so that the social support systems can function. And uh, other areas in various ministries, those will be identified and made known. So there's no point in running and coming and saying, I want to be out, I should have been in, I want no. It is being sought out, it is being worked out, and it will be a system of support for systems that keep us alive. Ladies and gentlemen, we tried very hard as a population to avoid this, to stay away from this. But clearly we didn't succeed in doing it. Virtually every country in the world, this we, we could say, well, this would be our, our second or third wave, or depending on what you want to call it, but it comes in waves. We had a first wave, we had a second, we are having a third, and of course we just have to not panic. This does not call for panic. We never panicked. We looked at it squarely in the eye and decided what is required of us. And this is what is required of us at this time. Now, with the kind of cooperation that I expect, these hard measures, these hard measures should mean that the period of high infection and high levels of death should be a shorter period. To try to avoid this now is to prolong the twilight period and to also allow a situation where what you have seen outside where the hospital steps are not available to those who want to go in and those who are dying are dying because they can't get a breath of oxygen. We're trying to avoid that through these measures. I've seen it being said that people in Trinidad and Tobago have been buying up oxygen tanks and there's a shortage of oxygen tanks. What that means is that some people in our population have come to the realization that a breath of oxygenated air is what stands between you and death. That's how serious it is. And we've seen situations in some countries where for the want of an oxygen tank, lives were being lost on the pavement of the hospital or even on the hospital ward. These actions are taken to avoid that. In anticipation of a demand for bed space for the COVID response beyond what we already have and what we have been adding to, we are taking steps to have um, a couple of field hospitals, which I'm pleased to announce are in place and being outfitted for service, one in Cuba and one in Port of Spain. And these will provide additional support for certain kinds of patients because the doctors kept telling us all along 
in the management of this COVID, patients are categorized based on their clinical state at one point, and you can handle them differently, but they're not all in one category and needing the same attention so they all be in one hospital. We have been putting them in stages, and the, 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 the field hospitals will allow us to expand the availability of beds for certain categories of patients and so on. And um, Dr. Uh, Parasam had mentioned earlier on that as part of the plan to provide that ability to get um, oxygenation, that we have, we have oxygen stations around the country, so on, and the Minister of Health at a later time will talk about that, if not in this press conference, but certainly later on. So we are taking steps to face even the most difficult outcome whenever it comes. And this is one aspect of a difficult outcome. And I am simply appealing to the population to cooperate. You have been known to cooperate. You can cooperate. In fact, in some instances, I'm pleasantly surprised at the level of cooperation that is anticipated or being experienced now. I want to thank the leadership of the business community for taking the lead in coming out and supporting these initiatives, not supporting the government, because this is not about the government. Because no government is on any bed in any hospital or in any morgue. The government is manager of the situation with the responsibility for taking decisions to give us the best chance to survive all the circumstances as they come at us. So I want to thank the leadership of the business community because had they not done so, the conversation after this press conference would have been a continuation of don't do this, don't do that because I'm going to lose this, I'm going to lose that. Right now, the singular conversation is whether or not you're going to lose your life or somebody you think well of, family or not, could lose his or her life. And the proper position is now being taken that we've got to put life first and close behind livelihood. Can't be the other way around. And for those people who think that they have to congregate or they have to go down to the supermarket, let me say it very clearly. Food supply systems will remain open daily. So there's no need to run down there all of you know like lemmings. If you haven't already gone so already since I spoke. The gas stations will remain open daily. So there's no need to rush down there this evening to make sure you're thankful this evening. Because it might be this evening when they go by the cashier to pay for the gas you rush for and to pick up some COVID this evening and carry it home for your grandmother or for your child. There's no need. These areas will continue to supply. So there's no need to rush to the pharmacy because you are afraid of somebody else doing what you are going to be doing, which is going to make sure you hold up. And because when you hold up, the word of shortages will spread. And it's now they'll rush down to get it. Please don't do that. It is not necessary. Because you may get COVID at the supermarket where you end up in a crowd trying to get the last thing of salmon or whatever you went for. And how sensible would that have been? Spread it out. We got some advice that we should shut the supermarkets down for a certain period of time and so on. To do that is to bring about exactly what we don't want. Because if you do that, when it opens, the rush is going to be there because it's going to be closed or it's going to be open. It's open all the time for reasonable hours from 6 in the morning till 8 in the evening, every day. What is it you want so that you have to go there every day in such large numbers that that becomes the place of potential infection? I also want to thank the Supermarket Association for assisting the government in understanding this issue and allowing us to manage our food supply in a way that getting food does not become the biggest threat to us. We don't want to be fed and dead. We, always, we have enough food. The supply systems are good. Those who are getting food support, you're going to get it. 
And if it calls for a little bit of patience, this situation demanded more patience. It's almost a year and a half we've been fighting this virus, and we're still not seeing the end of it. Patience is required, but common sense has to be the essential. So please don't rush down the gas station. Please don't rush down to the supermarket. Please don't rush to the pharmacy. And please don't hoard the food that's available for everybody. Take some. Kind of conversation make, could make people feel that you're not well served and it affects your response to the situation because you believe it's hopeless or you're in the hands of incompetence who are the reason why you are in fact exposed and in fact to die from this vaccine. So I just want to put the facts out there because facts are in an endangered species in an environment where misinformation, lies, and fake news seem to be on steroids. So, as chairman of CARICOM, I have available to me the vaccine application as of two days ago in CARICOM. And this, if, if you could look at the table, for those of you who can see it, something jumps out at you because I try to color code it. If you look at the the blue, you will see these are territories like Anguilla, uh, British Virgin Islands, Total and so on, Cayman Islands, Montserrat. These are British colonies. And they are, in terms of receiving vaccines, they are part of the British support and supply system. So you will see um, that Anguilla, it is in um, Anguilla would have got 10,000 vaccines available, administered. And you may say, well, how have Anguilla could have 10,000, but Trinidad and Tobago only has 60,000? Anguilla is a handful of people. Well, that 10,000 would have come to Anguilla from England. And Montserrat, if you look at Montserrat, you'll see Montserrat would have had 5,000 vaccines and they would have administered 2,000. But Montserrat only has three and a half thousand people. And they would have got their vaccines early o'clock from Britain. And of course, the same thing with uh, British Virgin Islands. You see they had 32,000 vaccines in their total. They too would have got it from Britain. But on the other hand, come to the first column. There are three categories of vaccines here. You would see India. 
as a as a, as a, as a source supplying CARICOM. And of course, bear in mind that Jamaica has twice as much people as Trinidad and Tobago. So if you run down the list, you will see from the Indian offerings, starting with 100,000 to Barbados first in February. And remember that, that was when Barbados was in a calamitous situation like we are in now. They got 100,000 from, from India. A couple of other countries said to Barbados then, we can't give you any, because if we give you, we'll have to give the others. But India gave Barbados 100,000, and Barbados gave us 2,000 from that. But if you look at the, the list in the end, at all the, the people who received from Barbados, from India, you will see Antigua got 40,000, the Bahamas got 20,000, Belize got 25,000, uh, Guyana got 80,000, and Jamaica got 50,000. And Trinidad and Tobago got 40,000. So there's no set pattern. And this decision as to how much you got was purely a decision of the Indian government, how much they will give to you. And of course, we all got those in the period between February, February 9th, when Barbados was the first, and Trinidad and Tobago on April 14th. And most people got it in March, right? And the vaccine that, all those vaccines, were the AstraZeneca vaccines. So had we not got those AstraZeneca gifts from India, all the way down to the middle of April, there was not a single vaccine available to the CARICOM countries. Not one. So we started off with that. So the next thing now is where we were all along, which was the COVAX facility. Category two, where vaccines came from, the COVAX facility. And this is interesting. You would see that Barbados would have got 33,000, same as Trinidad and Tobago, even though Trinidad and Tobago's population is three times Barbados. And Jamaica would have got, from the first COVAX, Jamaica would have got 14,000, even though Jamaica's population is twice Trinidad and Tobago's. But interestingly enough, Jamaica, just about that same time, had got 75,000 vaccines from South Africa because South Africa had shut down the use of AstraZeneca vaccines because of the variant um, situation, and they had a few AstraZeneca vaccines that were expiring, and they gave Jamaica 75,000 of that. Now, between the COVAX and the Indian gifts, the only other vaccine that came into this country, because we are now on the second tranche of COVAX, and again, you look, you'd see the Baham you would see Trinidad, the Baham you see the Bahamas, Barbados, Belize, and Trinidad and Tobago getting the same 33,600, even though our population is two or three or four times theirs. Because the decision to, as to how much you get is not ours. It's an allocation, because the COVAX is a world program, it's an allocation. It is my view that Trinidad and Tobago is categorized in that way numerically, because at the time when this decision was being made, our COVID, COVID problem was not as bad as it is now. In fact, it was much better. So we were actually um, being categorized to only get in this tranche the same amount as Antigua or as Barbados or as Belize, even though we had a larger population. Now, the only other vaccines that have been available to CARICOM people in Guyana Contrary to the government of Trinidad and Tobago that decided that we were only going to use WHO approved vaccines, Guyana decided for reasons best known to them that they will use Sinopharm from China and Sputnik from Russia long before the WHO approved it. And of course, Guyana used um, 45,000 vaccines of that nature. 
and they were the only CARICOM countries outside of Dominica who also used to, um, got 20,000 Sino Farm and St. Vincent got Sputnik and one that I've never heard of before one called Gamaleya or is it Gamaleya Sputnik? I don't know. Gamaleya Sputnik, right. But again, it was only 1,800 vaccines, but they used it. Right? We stayed with our policy of WHO, approved vaccines and we're there. And when you come to the final position now, as of today, vaccines, vaccine administered doses as of May 10th, as follows. Antigua, even though they had a larger number, this is the vaccines that have actually been put in arms, put in shoulders. 30,000 in Antigua, 36,000 in the Bahamas, 97,000 in Barbados, again, and that is because Barbados got their 100,000 in February in their peculiar situation, and nobody else got that. 47,000 in Belize, 57,000 in Bermuda. And again, that is because that is part of the British system. Cayman Islands, 68,000. Same reason. Dominica, 29,000. Grenada, 17,000. Jamaica, 145,000. St. Kitts and Nevis, 13,000. St. Lucia, 31,000. St. Vincent, 14,000, Suriname, 41,000, Trinidad and Tobago, 59,387, and we continue. So it is quite wrong to say that we are in a place that is different to the rest of the CARICOM. To try to put that out there, uh, you know, bar talk the Prime Minister, that's part for the course, bar talk the government, but in terms of misrepresenting the facts, these are the facts. We are in the COVAX arrangement. We are in the WHO approved arrangements. And there have been no other vaccines available to CARICOM. And none of these CARICOM countries have been able to use their private sector to go out and buy a single dose of vaccine for them. Not Trinidad and Tobago, not Jamaica, not Belize, not anybody in the CARICOM because vaccines are not available for purchase. So when you pick up economists and put them on the television to tell the country that the problem that we are having is because we are not vaccinating and the answer is to vaccinate and bring the economy back, they are just annoying you. It is not that we have the vaccines and we are not using it or the vaccines are available and we are not getting it. It is that the availability of vaccines is part of the problem of response, not only for us. And finally, I could tell you, I have been in contact with the highest levels of the American administration as chairman of CARICOM, as prime minister of Trinidad and Tobago, in phone meetings, in discussions with politicians, chairman of committees in the United States Parliament, and of course, people who are managing their show. The position is, the position is, for as long as they hold it that way, that they will not make any vaccines available to us until they have fully satisfied their own population. And of course, they control the supply at the various factories within their countries. And that is whether it's the UK, whether it's the United States, whether it is Germany, and of course, there are some countries who could place an order for 20 million units. And of course, the big suppliers would look at that. And those of us who need less than a million, they'll say to us, we'll talk to you later, maybe in July. We told you earlier on that we are part of the African Medical Supply Platform because they are talking to, in a large dose buying, with the actual manufacturers. That's still going on. The process is still going on there. And the prospect of getting from that is now late August at best, late August. So as of now, vaccine-wise, we are waiting for policy decision changes at the level of those who control the supply 
And you would have seen the head of the WHO pleading with developed countries not to vaccinate their children with the vaccines that are available, but to try and make those vaccines available to people who don't have vaccines, even to vaccinate their frontline workers. But it's Dr. Ple Dr. Tedros is only pleading until the policy changes at the governmental level, this is only a request. Just like the request to allow the patents mm -hmm. to be lifted so that the vaccine can be produced outside of the restricted area where they're being produced now, in the restricted companies who hold the patents. These are conversations that are still in the category of an appeal to those who control it. So we, we know that it would be a whole lot better, and it would have been a whole lot better if we had got vaccines from day one. But it was never available. It still is not available. So let us not use that as a, as a, as a response. And because you know that, it is more important to do what you can do, what is, in within, what is within your power. We have no power to demand that these people don't use the vaccines that they have to vaccinate their children who are not as exposed as other people are. We have no power to do that except to go through the normal channels and make the diplomatic entreaties and we have been doing that relentlessly. Only um, this week I was in a very productive meeting with Chairman of Chairman Benny Thompson, who is chairman of the Home Homeland Security in the United States. Before that, SCARICOM, I was in with Maxine Waters, who is working very hard for us. I mean, I'm very impressed. If she was a Caribbean MP, she couldn't have worked harder for us in Washington. Uh, Greg Meeks, who is there, these are people who are working hard for us within the corridors of power in the United States. But until the policy changes, we are in that situation. So, um, it's, it sounds nice and it sounds sensible and wonderful, but the simple solution to vaccinate the population and get away from this situation, as soon as the vaccines are available to us, and we're not relying on gifts, eh? we want to purchase vaccines and we can't purchase it. We'll accept gifts once they are WHO approved vaccines, and we are prepared to pay for vaccines. I'm seeing, I see it being said that we were offered vaccines from Pfizer and we refused because of the price. That is a lie. L-I-E. We never were in a position to buy vaccines from Pfizer and we didn't do it because of the price. We were in conversations with, with Pfizer with the understanding that we may have been able to buy from them. They, they eventually said no, it's not available. And of course, there were indicative ideas as to what the price might be. Eh? But there was never a situation where we did not get the vaccine because we didn't choose to pay for it. Because I tell you, from this platform I told you earlier on, we will do what has to be done. And even if we had to go to the Heritage Fund to take out money to pay for the vaccine, we would have done it. But we don't have to do that. We can do it without, without that. And if we have to do that, that's an option that's available to us. So it's never a case of not wanting to pay. Who is mad enough to have money in the bank and sick? And you have to buy medication to save your life and say, no, no, I'm not touching my savings. Ladies and gentlemen, I have been a follower of Calypso for a long time, since I was in primary school. And today, two Calypsonians have come to my aid. One, Brother Mudada. And he simply says, the thing ain't care. They think and care about nobody. So understand that nobody is exempted from this. And Devon Seals has come to my aid to appeal to you. And he say, in his calypso, so he say, don't jackass the thing. <laughs> understand? I know you know calypso like I know it. The calypsonians have spoken, not just the prime minister. We are in serious difficulty. We have always been, but not in as deep as this. But we can manage it if we do what the common sense responses are. 
We're not inventing any wheel here. We've done it before last year, and we have to be called upon to do it again now. And that is all I want to say today, and you will hear a whole lot more as the Attorney General and his team puts the details of what I've just said about the state of emergency and the restrictions that are placed on the movement. Now, some people see this as punishment, but the real reason is not punishment. It is to reduce the movement and gathering of people down to the bare bones, where the bones are the essential services in their various forms, as will be described by the documents that will come out later on and the clarifications that will be given. I don't have anything else to say today. And Minister of Health, do you have anything to add? It is... Do you, you have anything that would be useful? No? Okay, thank you. Um, we will have a few questions. Uh, we, we, maximum two questions. Oh, sorry, Dr. Chapman. Because of what I've just said, we expect people to be home. We, not, we don't expect all the sick persons to be in the hospitals. We expect a lot of sick people to be home. Dr. Chapman will tell you how to manage that. Honorable Prime Minister, Ministers, my colleagues, Dr. Hines, Dr. Richards, my health care workers, the army out front, members of the listening and viewing public, members of the media. The Prime Minister would have said last time we spoke, spoke he quoted Isaiah 2620, go into your homes, stay and wait until the storm is over. We are at that point now. And I am asking that when you are at home, that you keep the principles that we stand on, that I know will be there with and without the vaccination. Even at home, you have to go ahead and isolate even with your family, especially if there is a sick member at home. Masking, distancing, making sure not to share utensils, eating utensils, bathroom facilities, washing your hands, keeping your surfaces clean. We are seeing countless stories of primary contacts in the clinical setting who have become positive because of other people in their homes who they admit to eating with without their masks, hugging goodnight and saying goodnight, sleeping in the same bed with. <clears throat> These are real stories. These are real descriptions of the patients that we see. It is critical that when you are at home, that you go ahead and you home isolate with the same sort of diligence that you do and that you continue to do in the public. Distance, sanitize, and mask. I thank the Honorable Prime Minister for the opportunity to freeze this movement. I beg the population for us to indeed freeze. We don't need the police. We don't need the army. You know what needs to be done. We in the health field are saying our backs are breaking. We signed up to help you. And when you come to us and we can't help, we can't do what we have put our lives for. In addition, I want to point out that the 4,000 plus people that are home with COVID, some are asymptomatic, but some are sick. And we have to respond to those people also. They are not just left there. They are monitored by our doctors and responded to by a healthcare system that embraces them if they no longer fit the criteria to be home. 
and we want to be prepared and we can't if the hospital admissions keep going up and up and up. I want to again thank the Ministry of Health for the step up, step down units. They have given us a chance to catch a breath. Those people are not going home. They're going to another facility that allows us to take in the acute care person. But I do want to highlight that a lot of these people that are coming in are ill. A lot of our patients require HDU and ICU care. You don't need to be there. Just don't get COVID. And COVID won't spread if you don't give it the opportunity to go from one to the other. I implore you, more of us are at home, more of us are ill at home. Please, isolate at home. That means if you have a sick member at home, you are to be masked. If indeed you are home, you are not to share the same bathroom and you are not to share the same eating facilities. You are to diligently clean your surfaces and wash your hands. Last but not least, I am still hearing the stories on the deathbeds of people who are in parties. We know, we've heard about curfew parties, we've been here before. Don't be a part of that. There are people who will try to organize themselves, but that again puts a congregation together. We don't want any more deaths. We want to save lives. We need you in the community at this point that we are to join us as we did before. We are going to beat this and rise again. But when your opportunity comes, vaccinate. I know you're seeing a lot there. People don't have to wear masks in America and this and that and the other. We need our masks now. We need to sanitize. We need to distance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Trotman. I have just put up that slide there from an article that was published in yesterday's Express coming out of Washington from an expert at Georgetown University. And the headline reads, vaccine shortage may last for years. That is not CARICOM saying that. That is not saying me saying that. That is a fact as determined by the experts in Washington. But interestingly enough, if you go to the last line in the article, it concludes there is simply not enough vaccine to go around. But if you look at the paragraph at the top right-hand corner, that is the gist of the whole thing, where it says, the United States, European, and other wealthy nations long ago pre-ordered nearly all the doses available. And now other countries, even with the money to buy, are at the back of the line waiting, said Matthew Kavanaugh a global health policy expert at Georgetown University. I tell you this so that the go-to people in Trinidad and Tobago who run into the television every night and talking about we need to vaccinate the population, vaccinate the population, with what? We are doing everything that can be done in this situation to make sure that whatever vaccine is available, we get and we use because it's another thing to get vaccines and then the population for one reason or the other is hesitant or reluctant or refusing to use it. I'm today appealing to the population to do what Dr. Gopi Singh has said. And Dr. Gopi Singh is a, doc, a very experienced doctor in Trinidad and Tobago who came out of the political arena to tell you, use whatever vaccine is available because for this purpose, once the vaccine has passed, must start the WHO, a vaccine is a vaccine. And of course, for those who will tell you this vaccine has this downside and this side effect, every single medicine you use can be so categorized. Even water, you drink too much of it and you drown if you're in the wrong place and you can't breathe at the same time. So 
let us be mindful, be careful. What you use as a medicine into your body is your right. Your, that is your fundamental decision, whether you take health care in a particular form or not. So I could only encourage you because of the benefits to be had. But the government will do everything possible to make vaccines available. We have not called you out in your tens of thousands to line up to be vaccinated because we don't have the vaccines. We have called you out in relation to the vaccines that we have had. We have put stations around the country. We know 28 stations not enough. Maybe 280 is what is required. But if we have 280 stations and we call you all out and we don't have the vaccines, the next conversation is no vaccine and then you may waste my time. So we're managing the situation. As I speak to you now, we are making transportation arrangements to bring in 100,000 of the Sinopharm WHO approved vaccines from China. I'm asking you, if you do not have a, a reason that satisfies you, because not everybody um, is without a medical condition that may cause additional pause or may want to have a different vaccine for that particular purpose. But in general, especially if you do not have some uh, condition that, that spell that out to you, and if you are not out there exposed, especially if you are in the frontline service, take the vaccine. Because our best way out of this, this is the one position I agree with, with the go-to people. When all is said and done, the only thing we know now is that our best way out of this, as of now, is to get as many people vaccinated, which reduces the ability of the virus to happily jump from person to person. And if you do get sick as a vaccinated person, the level of your infirmity would be reduced and you may not need, or um, the, the statistics show you more than likely will not need hospital care and you certainly will not need um, HDU or ICU care. So there's a benefit in the vaccine and the more people in the country that get vaccinated, the stronger the country will be in responding as an entity to the virus and then we can go back to doing all the things we want to do that we must do as some people will tell us so the vaccination program is an integral part now of our response and as we get the hundred thousand we'll be using it up and then as time goes on the weeks go on into months and so on we should be getting a supply in it is my expectation given away i am in the corridors discussing what is coming to covax and how the covax is being seen and other possibilities by the time we get a little further down the road and of course our friends are fully vaccinated it opens the door for us to be getting more vaccine so i don't want to put a date or a time but it is not an unending dark tunnel there is some light appearing at the end of the tunnel let us use that light to guide us to a more sensible place. And the one place we don't want to be in Trinidad and Tobago is a place where there are so many easily infected persons that when you extract from those, the ones who require hospital care, that, that care isn't available. I mean, I am absolutely in awe and admiration of our healthcare workers who have been on the job since January last year, holding the line, pushed very hard by the virus, being pushed harder by the people. Just remember, you can't replace a doctor with a teacher or a priest unless you're dealing with bush medicine. You can't really replace a nurse with a janitor. It takes years of training to be a doctor or to be a nurse or a technologist in the hospital. And therefore, as the numbers rise week to week, we can't increase the number of nurses. All we will be doing is putting more load on the shoulder of those who've been carrying the load since last year, January. Feel for them too and their families. So if you are being irresponsible, you're nearly as bad as the virus. 
And I'm sure there's nobody in Trinidad and Tobago who wants to be so categorized. Be conscious. Be cooperative. Be reasonable. And be safe. That's all we can ask of you. And the more we cooperate, the shorter will be the period of inconvenience. Couple of questions and we're done. One question, please. One. I'll be back with you anyway, let's put this. Fair enough. One question. Um, it might be a lengthy question. If it's a lengthy question, it's a speech. <laughs> uh, how long would the SUV last for? And the last SUV we had, uh, there were some cases of uh, abuse. Uh, what measures, if any, have been put in place to ensure that this doesn't happen? The simple answer to that is that none of us in this country have ever been in a state of emergency during a pandemic. Take that. Use that as your guide. This is not a comparison of another state of emergency. This situation calls for this, and the length of it will be determined by the response that we get. I am saying the more cooperative the response, the shorter will be the period. Yes, Jill. Uh, Prime Minister, just uh, follow up on Jensen's question. In terms of the issue of constitutional rights and so on, because you did say at the last press conference, if I'm not mistaken, the pandemic issue doesn't necessarily need the lifting of constitutional rights for a solution, but we are here now. What can you tell the public about that? All of that has been solved by me using the state of emergency, which is properly ensconced in the laws of Trinidad and Tobago. Because you see, I didn't want to use the provision that is existing now in the public health ordinance. Because not very many people give the respect to the ordinance that they give to the state of emergency. I mean, even people who should know better. When we use the ordinance clauses, and I said that population, you are saying that the police cannot come to your private space, and therefore you, in defiance, would misbehave in those spaces, the parties and the whatever. Instead of hearing from those who should know better that, listen, OK, all right. Let's get on with it and not have it. Oh, yes, you have the right to do it. And no police could come in the space. But I did say the police is coming under the provisions of the public health ordinance, which is what we are using. And in the public health ordinance, it says the authority to come to any space, public or private, is with the public health officer, Dr. Parasham staff. And they could call for assistance, unlimited. It says assistance. Now, who do you think the government will use to assist the public health officer? Not the police. So the police gets the starting orders to come to the private space by the authority given to the public health officer who can call on the police for assistance. That is written in the law. And then, of course, you know, men from the inner temple and the outer temple jump out and say, no, private space is sacrosanct. And then when it turned out, that other men from other temples said, but the law provides for it, and the court has adjudicated upon it. They then say, oh, well, you know, we did say that under certain circumstances. So what do you think I was saying? What was I saying? When they come with the public health officer, isn't that under certain circumstances? And then worse, one particular advisor was saying to me before, don't do that, because it does, it's not provided. When it was shown that the public health ordinance provided for that, you know what the response was? Well, the public health ordinance is too broad. So what should have been done is it should have come to Parliament and pass a COVID law. Just ask yourself, if the existing public health ordinance is too broad, and we instead come to Parliament and pass a new law, will that new law be broader or more restrictive? It has to be more restrictive, otherwise you wouldn't do it. 
And if it is more restrictive, is that what you really want under the current circumstance? To restrict the authority of the police to shut down parties that are organized in some instances for profit to generate sick people, to infect other people, and you get them counted by how many dead? Is that what you really want? Mr. Astafan from Dominica made a vid blog at early in the, in the pandemic talking to lawyers in Dominica as to what he expected them to do in helping out in this situation. And he ended by saying, it's not to show how bright you are, but at least if you're bright at all. Because this is not about how bright you are, how much you know, and how often you can go on television and misdirect those who are easily misdirected and having the government to come all the time trying to undo your tangles. Simple and straightforward, you know. There are some people in this country, everything the government tells you is a lie. What is the truth? What I don't want to hear from you. But we've gone past that now, eh? We are at the stage now, like they were in Bergamo in Italy, where the whole thing was being driven by the number of coffins. That's where we are. So I'm not going to engage any more of these carryings on. Lives are at stake. And we are going to do what has to be done to give the people of Trinidad and Tobago the best chance of saving lives. Renuka? Um, Minister Dial Singh, uh, Dr. Abdul Richards was saying that we are out of beds or almost out of beds in the parallel healthcare system. Some time ago you said that you will not let an overburdened parallel system tax or leverage on the traditional healthcare. What are the provisions outside of the two medical tents that the U.S. Um, government provided? What are the provisions being made if there is an overflow of the parallel sure. healthcare system? Thank you. So let's look at the numbers. Prior to last weekend, we had 462 um, beds, ward beds in the system. Um, when you add ICU and HDU to that, we had 542. In the space of one week, we added 130. That takes you up, if you add 130 to 542, that is what, 672, around there. Then we are going to add 80 more with the two field hospitals. It is our hope that the surge capacity provided by the 130 plus 80, which is 210, if my maths are correct, that will be more than sufficient to see us through. What we are hoping that with the public's um, behavior to stop gathering, that the need, the demand for hospital beds will go down. So for now, with the addition of 130 plus 80, 210, we should be able to rally out the upcoming two-week period. But, as Dr. Richards and I constantly say, this is a finite resource. The public has to work with us to dampen the demand for beds because it is not an infinite supply. Okay? So right now, we should be all right. Let me just add one thing that Dr. Richards would have added if she was up there. It is not a bed with a mattress mm -hmm. and a pillow. We could add those if we have to under certain circumstances. We could use cuts if we have to. But by the bed, you have to have doctors and nurses. So you put in, if you put 200 cuts under a tent, that's a hospital. But you may not have a doctor or a nurse to go there until, you, until the bed is doctored and nursed and technologist and everybody in the system to service the bed. The bed is not really the end of the story. So there are a number of beds. That's only a guide. And as I said earlier on, the people, the limited number of people we have to fight this, they've been on the job since January last year. So take that into account that even if you get a bed, and you, you saw it on television. Even if you get a bed, it may require six or seven people at that bedside to keep you breathing. Or you might be there, as you would have seen on television. 
not having a trained person from the health department come to you even while you're on the bed. We've seen it. So, so, so adding the number of beds is only one part of the supply. The real trouble that is going to come is when we have the beds and there are patients on the beds, but the people to treat with the patients' clinical conditions are not there. Or they're too tired, or they're just, you know, broken down. So you have to think about all of this as you fashion your own behavior. So, so let me just let me just jump off from where the Prime Minister says, um, because the question will be how are we manning those beds, and that's why we said uh, about a week ago, we will have to look seriously at elective surgeries and just doing those emergency elective surgeries that frees up doctors and nurses. Also, we said as we did last year, we will be um, de-escalating our outpatient clinics. So that frees up personnel and how we deal with those outpatient clinics, telemedicine, automatic refills of prescriptions and so on. Also with the field hospitals, we'll be utilizing medical staff from the TTDF. But again, this is a finite resource. And to tell you how difficult it is, I was down ED to set up the, the point fourteen area facility with 40 beds. On my way up, I got the videos of what was happening in Lopino with the hiking club. And I said to myself, wait a minute, 75 people going to hike, 40% positivity rate that Dr. Thing talks about, that is 30 people positive. They go home and infect their parents. The 40 bears I just put on in point 14 is not enough to take care of the hiking club. That, that is what occupied my mind. One act of irresponsibility will crash the system. So, yes. Yes. Are you, has Cabinet considered postponing SEA? Um, we immediately will postpone the face to face contact with students. And the Minister of Health will, the Minister of Education, Education will adjust that issue within 48 hours. But as of now, the first rollback that we'll do is stop the face-to-face. -face. Because, you see, if we can at all manage to get the exams out of the way, in the difficult situation, we will do it. But if it is beyond a reasonable action, then we won't do it. But we've always said we'll hold the date until it gets to a point where we, the date is no longer usable. Huh? But the Minister of Education, by public Tuesday, will give you that. So let's not, um, we know that it's there. We've been trying, because you see, you solve one problem and you create another one. Because if we, if we don't get the exams done, once that is the action, the next question is, what is the situation having not done the exams? You know? So we try, we, we're trying to um, see whether we can get it done without... Um, it might even be, given what, what we are doing in terms of the movement of people, the environment might be even safer to get it done now than before when there was more movement, because the, 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 the most dangerous places now, unfortunately, are in and around the homes. Point of clarification, Prime Minister, if I'm not mistaken, May 23rd is the original date for the end of what we call the lockdown now. With the state of emergency, will that, will, is that date realistic and will there be a state of emergency well, after the 23rd or beyond? The, the state of emergency that we put in place now will remain in place um, until it is either expired or discontinued. We, are, we, we move into a state of emergency, but not until next week or week after. We are in a state of emergency, and I will hold it that way for the time being. The 23rd is where we had looked at another day's cast in stone. All of these dates that you're referring to, like the 23rd, are controlled by Dr. Hines' data. You understand? So the, the state of emergency allows us, under law, to be there for 90 days. So at least 90 days in the first instance. It may not be 
90 days, maybe 30, maybe 60. But it is in place now to allow us to um, have a bit more um, rule back. And of course, I am acknowledging the hard work that was being done, that is being done, that will be required to be done by the police, the fire service, the defense force, and I'm simply asking them to continue to serve the country in the way that they have done. I know every now and then something wouldn't go right and that becomes a big conflagration because a lot of what goes right doesn't make the news. Like in the hospital, you know, you do a thousand procedures and no news is good news and then one person has an issue and then that is the hospital story. We know that, but we do know that there are families out there who have produced officers in these categories and in Trinidad and Tobago, um, they do well by and large. And I, while I'm on this show, I want to tell you that the Prime Minister of St. Vincent has told me to extend to the people of Trinidad and Tobago his eternal gratitude for the good work done by our officers who came there in a moment of crisis and did human service for the people of St. Vincent. They've gone and they've come back and I want to thank the officers for holding the charges in place. And this is yet another time that Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force personnel have gone to Caribbean um, locations to assist and have distinguished themselves by their discipline and their contribution. They did it in Montserrat, they did it in St. Vincent before, they did it in Dominica. So when you think about bad-mouthing them, just remember that there has been another side to the story that it's usually more good than bad. So thanks for coming in from St. Vincent for that. Thank you all very much. You have, you have, you have one more. And, and, and quickly, since you all are the only ones who have come out and be allowed in this dangerous environment, you'll be allowed one more question for the edification of the public. Minister, any update in terms of the P1 variant, in terms of number of cases, and if this is a, what uh, any in any way contributing to the issue of research? Dr. Hines will answer that technical question. Okay, thank you for the question. Now, as we said before, the testing capacity to verify whether every single case is a P1 or not is not available. We will continue to compile data on the more severe cases on the fatal outcomes, and when that data is compiled and available, we will share it. What I can say, however, is that irrespective of whichever variant is in circulation, the way that the virus is transmitted has not changed. In fact, if we are seeing, as some of the evidence does suggest, that the virus may be more transmissible, meaning that it can spread from one person to another a little more easily, then what we are also seeing is that we need to be even more vigilant and even more stringent in taking the existing measures to prevent spread seriously. So regardless of whether it's the P1 or the Wuhan variant, the measures are or we out of this until such time as we have additional vaccination and other things in play in the population. So we will pro provide the updates as that data is compiled, and we'll get back to you on that. Yes. Is this going to affect the rollout of the, vac the Sinopharm vaccine in any way? Oh, yes. Thanks. Okay, so the expected, don't hold me to a date, because weather, flight delays, crew changeover is coming from Beijing, the expected arrival date is sometime late on Tuesday night. Assuming it arrives on Tuesday night, it will be in our warehouses early Wednesday morning. Um, typically, we start to roll out shots and arms about three, two to three working days after receipt of the vaccine. So, Assuming we receive it on Wednesday, we could start to vaccinate people as early as Saturday, and we're already gearing for that. So with that 100,000 doses, being a two-shot vaccine, and no, this is not ordering two doubles, as the means say, <laughs> it's a two-shot vac vaccine. Um, second shot to be administered three to four weeks after. It means within a three-week, four-week, period, we could vaccinate 50,000 persons. When you add that to the 60,000 persons we'll vaccinate with AstraZeneca, 60 and 50, we'll have vaccinated 110,000 persons by the middle of July. 
which is a phenomenal feat. Um, with this new, the increase in cases and increase in deaths, uh, people on platforms are asking whether they will be considered uh, in the next ro rollout, as well as the elderly homes. Yes. That is part of the plan, Dr. Rohit Doon and Dr. Um, Roshan Parashram. A certain number of doses from the Sinopharm batch are in fact dedicated to the elderly in homes. So you are spot on. Uh, I figure 10%, 20%? Um, it's about somewhere around five to 700 doses um, will be allocated to elderly homes, yeah. Any special treatment? Which platform is speaking? No, we, no um, so we are going to stick with our policy of vaccinating healthcare workers, and let me thank healthcare workers, persons over 60 with or without comorbidities, and as we did with the last tranche of AstraZeneca, persons under 50 with comorbidities. So that is how we are going. So if you are working on a rig and you are under 50 with comorbidities, you can sign, sign up for it. My one more was for you. Well, sir, mine is actually about the um, loan that we took from China for the vaccines. Um, we didn't specifically take a loan for the vaccine. We were in the process of getting a, a loan from China as part of our international borrowing from the budget arrangements. Um, and what is, what is happening is that since that money is coming in, already approved and all that, we will just pay from that account. I was just seeking clarification. Last the question is here. <laughs> <laughs> if it has been said already, just for this press oh. conference, in terms of the, so if someone has the AstraZeneca, the second dose? Yes. Yeah. So there is no... At this point in time, there is no interchangeability between vaccine brands or vaccine types. So persons who receive their first dose of AstraZeneca are guaranteed a second dose of AstraZeneca. Persons who receive their first dose of Sinopharm, so when we vaccinate 50,000 persons with Sinopharm, we hold back 50,000 for their second shot. There is no interchangeability. Well, thank you very much for coming and facilitating our press conference. I simply want to say to those persons who have lost loved ones and associates that we got to get on with the job, but we do so hearing and bearing some of the pain. We hear your pain. And for those who are demanding that we do more, we do as much as is reasonable, as is reasonably available, affordable, or for those of you who know that you're doing well, we continue to rely on you to not give up. Keep on doing what you have been doing well. And having said that, I remain confident that together we can work our way out of these situations. I thank you very much for your attention.